Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Eh, buenas tardes o buenos días a todos, eh, según donde estén. Gracias buenos por días. vuestra invitación. Y buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Eh, introducing you to everybody, I think we're very excited for the lecture that we're going to hear today about how architecture is being impacted with all, all the entrepreneurial and innovation aspects going on uh, to make more broader and more holistic Uh, profile. So introducing uh, Jerónimo for everybody. He is uh, the academic director for the Master in Business for Architecture and Design at the IE School of Architecture and Design. We're pretty excited because we've had IE uh, present in our event every day. Uh, we've already had Elvira, uh, Roberto and Martha and we're wrapping up this amazing content brought to you by IE with Jerónimo today. So we're very excited about that. Um, he's a Spanish architect. Uh, he has a master in architecture as well from uh, Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Um, so he's very renowned in architecture in Spain, worked with many different uh, architecture firms. And he right now um, is focusing on identifying scalable entrepreneurship opportunities with the intersections that design can have with different fields. So Jerónimo, welcome. I think we're more than ready to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this very kind and, and complete introduction. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here. Thanks to Mayo for this wonderful week. Uh, looking forward to, to the presentation. Hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, should I just share my screen then? Yes. Okay. There we go. Please let me know if you can see it correctly. Yes, I think we only have to see you in the camera. That's it. Can you see me now? Uh, no, I think you have to turn on your camera. Let me let me see. Um, sorry about that. Um, it's turning off the camera when I turn on the sharing. Now, perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but you're seeing the slides complete. Is that correct? If I if I keep going like this? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. So I'll start timing. Um, well, um, welcome. Um, this is a, a lecture that I, I've decided to entitle the entrepreneurial architect uh, spatial um, problem solving beyond buildings because it's actually really about that. This is a conversation we've had Uh, a number of times with uh, Mayo, a very entrepreneurial firm, and definitely contributing to expand the field of, of what architects can can really do. So the agenda of today, or, or, or the structure of my presentation, is going to be first uh, making everyone sort of aware of transformations that are in our industry. Probably you're already aware of them, but just good to have them in mind for this uh, for this um, reflection. Then uh, introducing a shift in mindset that we see from the educational world. And finally, uh, entering into the entrepreneurial approach, a few case studies uh, on, on how do we see design evolving beyond um, the making of buildings and some concluding thoughts and hopefully uh, a number of questions. So the perspective we're sharing is uh, definitely the perspective from education uh, with the role that we have, that I have as the leader of the Master in Business for Architecture and Design to really think and, uh, about the architect of the immediate future, not only the long future, but like uh, the, the, what, what's going to be needed in the next you know, five to 10 years uh, um, and, and how to really make uh, the impact of our realm as big as possible, uh, considering all the transformations we have. And transformations are multiple on many, many levels. But just to summarize a few of them, uh, one of them is, is really about automation and AI, which uh, our industry is really picking up on. And uh, it goes from you know generative design to really implementation of construction processes of all kinds uh, that that raise questions about the role of architects, but also uh, very interesting debate by the way, but also questions about the role of other kind of profiles in in construction and what we can do um, you know to incorporate technology whereas at the same time responding to those those uh, realities. Uh, definitely something that is I think um, uh, reality for the next decades is demographic and urban pressure with cities currently absorbing around 200,000 people per day as uh, forecasted by World Economic Forum. And that uh, gives us a, not only a notion of the amount of work that we have ahead, but also the opportunities to, to actually 
um, do what we are called to do in a correct way. Um, and that's uh, and, and the cost of opportunity of not doing it as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, at the same time, our industry is, is having um, what some countries have called new uh, skills gap, which is, you know, this difficulty to uh, train and, and bring qualified different types of, of profiles into uh, the different processes uh, that our industry needs from, you know, design of houses to, um, to construction. And that, uh, for instance, in the UK, as this exhibit shows, is estimated in about 51% deficit, which is a huge number and that affects things like, you know, uh, in, um, affordable housing and things like that. And uh, global environmental challenges are as well something we we know and we understand at this moment, but it's pretty interesting to see how, uh, you know, on the left side in red, you can see the social, economic and industrial trends of production and how they ramp up uh, in parallel with earth system, you know, alert indicators starting in the in the 50s and, and really ramping up after the 90s and, you know, raising questions about what we can do uh, beyond shaping buildings in terms of thinking beyond, uh, you know, the, 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 the decisions that impact only shape, but about the whole cycle involved into the, the formalization of those spaces. Um, we also have changing space dynamics in the city, um, and I really like this one, uh, this article from the conversation that, that called, you know, empty cars, uh, empty car parks are appearing everywhere, but at the same time, there's nowhere to park. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fundamentally a management and approach problem uh, that is directly related to space, right? So it's not related necessarily to buildings, but to, to the cohort of public, private space and the in-between and how that can be managed. And definitely thinking about purely architectural services and the structure of companies in our industry, uh, we see that there are also a number of work dynamics uh, that, are, that are really changing. Uh, First, from a, a notion of the, the, let's say, the not ancient, but like the, the previous decades uh, model of authorship in the office that I, in, in many aspects, I also admire and is, was very valuable at that time, to models in which co-creation is the center. And I think that are, you know, are, are enriching a lot the, the profession and its relationship to society nowadays. Um, moving from macro, micro studios to more like one-stop shop companies that are big consultancies that we could call macro studios, uh, having local workforces versus having distributed workforces and some of them remote as we are seeing these times. Um, from a, an initial role that is, you know, the architect understanding itself as a consultant merely, which is fundamentally, you know, an important part of our work to uh, another approach or complementary approach in which the architect is understood, uh, understanding itself more as a partner. Um, and then finally, the difference between the Baumeister or the artisan um, and the, the notion of the strategic leader as, you know, the envisioning of oneself or, or a company and its services in, in the market out there. So let me just abstract from this big context and, and only look at one story of the relationship between technology and architecture for a moment. So it's, it's a parallel story. So it's, it's not like, you know, a historic treaty, what I'm going to bring now. But it does bring a reflection about our relationship with technology and in the fourth industrial revolution. So quite interestingly, uh, probably many of you know uh, the book of Le Corbusier towards an architecture in which he was uh, starting to compare, you know, the efficiency, the, the standardization of, of some modern industry elements uh, such as the cars with, you know, the architecture of, of temples in this case, but also uh, as, a, as an envisioning of what could be the architecture of his century. And that in fact, uh, was you know one of the seminal ideas of, of uh, the, the modern movement and, and all the examples that we know and, and treasure for many reasons that were in a, that, that represented a moment in which architecture was somehow like leading in terms of concept uh, the definition as well and the implementation of technology and it kept going and it kept developing up to reach you know uh, sky heights uh, in examples such as, you know, the, the, the Centre Pompidou from uh, Piano and Rogers and many others, the high tech movement and so on, in which really there was a, a kind of symbiotic relationship between the technology, a platformized industry in which there were different uh, specialists coming from different ends and adding to this big uh, sort of platform Lego that was uh, the building and that the Centre Pompidou represents as, as probably better than, than any other example and that it quite interestingly if we put it uh in parallel with some um you know car examples of, of that time really uh works in a very similar way as a platform basically a platform industry right and with, with 
multiple participants to end up building one single entity. Then, interestingly, uh, Remco has in 2014 in the B Venice Biennale brought up this this topic and this piece, the elements of architecture, in which uh, he was kind of claiming and, and making us aware of, of raising, you know, uh, alert and reflection about the fact that technology was becoming extremely uh, specialized um, and, and, you know, sort of long tail of different subsystems that were taking over somehow um, uh, over the quality or the essence of, of poetic space, architectural space in a way that is very well represented here in, the, in, in, in this picture, not so much in the experience you have uh, when you're under that full ceiling, but the picture really represents that the, the, the human being is in the lower part in a perfectly, uh, apparently perfectly and comf uh, perfectly uh, defined space and an extremely comfy space from the hygrothermic and, and you know human comfort parameters point of view. But I mean, between that and the essential beauty of the space, there's this whole conundrum of, of multiple systems that um, sometimes you know permit that comfort, but on the other hand, uh, you know imply a big price to pay, right? Um, and if we bring that to the for the industrial revolution, the technology uh, revolution that has been uh, present in the last decades, but mainly uh, in construction, I consider after 2015, the moment in which really investment ramps up and we start seeing a plethora of different uh, companies entering the space. What we see is that in the in the center, these two figures really represent the the image of of the architect, or let's say the the traditional uh, consultant, Baumeister architect, and on their sides, all around this conundrum of, of different tech applications that cover all sorts of, of verticals of the construction industry, including, by the way, uh, some of the design and uh, you know predictive generative design components that were uh, previously, the, let's say, the quintessential domain for the architect. Uh, so it's sort of a tension between you know, the, the traditional role and the modern industry moving really, really fast. And there's, there's apparently something that we need to, uh, we need to do, right? Because um, there are a lot of benefits in this revolution, but as well, we need to understand how to transform our role based on, uh, to, to coexist and to leverage that power, right? So the question is, how do we uh, redefine a space uh, in which uh, related to these changing work dynamics uh, and what uh, is, really this expanded domain of the architect in which uh, it coexists not only with technology, but it coexists with this notion of a wider one-stop shop company uh, that, that has you know, uh, uh, more agency beyond the creation of shape, uh, which remains a core. So I think the first question is, um, and something that we, 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 we encourage uh, young architects always to think about is what differentiates you as an architect uh, from any other kind of profession, and apart from the fact that you do buildings, in terms of in inner skills, unique set of skills that can make you thrive uh, in an interdisciplinary context in which the, 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 somehow the, the, the line between domains is kind of blurred, right? And more and more will be blurred, and opportunity will be actually on those blurry lines. So, I mean, different people could claim different, uh, of course, um, skills, but I think quite a complete, uh, complex and, and complete vision would be that um, we are more and more seen from different industries outside, let's say, the built environment as phenomenal uh, complex problem solvers. And by complex problem, I mean problems that do not have necessarily a right or a wrong and that uh, bring into the resolution bo both qualitative and quantitative factors uh, that need to be negotiated rather than optimized, right? So we're definitely spatial experts, and that's uh, somehow for granted. And it's probably the one of the most specific domains. Um, but we're also very good system thinkers in the fact that, uh, as a result of of the fact that we've been, you know, for for centuries, thousands of years, building, uh, designing buildings that, uh, again, never have these, you know, right or wrong, and bringing engineering, uh, humanities, uh, artistic. Um, uh, economic, all sorts of different factors that need to coincide to make this huge investment of resources, time, uh, coordination, uh, a reality, right? So we're very used to think in, in systems and bringing different variables. Um, at the same time, we need, uh, we've needed uh, since the start of our, of our profession to communicate messages 
in the long term uh, to make people believe that uh, what we're doing for one year, two years, 10 years, uh, even 25 years, when you think about the future of a city or something like that, uh, it's doable, right? And it's doable under terms that are exciting and viable for everyone. So it's about building a vision and vision is about synthesis. And that is uh, something that we're uh, ex extremely good. I was uh, listening to the previous lecture and uh, re responding to a question about um, suppliers, um, that there was, uh, you know, the response raised uh, the idea of, of uh, rendering on images. And definitely uh, it's something we're so used to think, uh, to use as, as the basis of our thinking that we not even realize how special that is. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we're also very good transdisciplinary communicators. And that's more and more useful in, in different industries and companies that, that more and more have, you know, these kind of themes. So we're, we're very good at transmitting, you know, economic reasons for something, perhaps not as good as an economist, but yes, uh, better than the average or way better than the average. Whereas at the same time communicating, you know, a, a, an idea about, you know, how a building relates to the culture of a place or to participation and social uh, dynamics and behavior and so on. So that's, as a result, we can act very well as, as kind of connectors between different people. Um, and as, as if you are studying uh, somebody of, you know, some of you that are listening to us are studying, uh, you very, you know, very well or have experienced very well. And if you are already working, probably you are even more aware we are experimental workers. We're, we're profiles that are used to uh, build the, our own definition of our own problems in a way. So what this building is going to look like, how we're going to respond to these kind of briefies not only about responding to the square meters uh, needed for each space and the relationships between the spaces, but actually about building a thesis about what is the problem behind and uh, starting to work with a lot of uncertainties. And that's that's definitely very valuable in, in the environment and the, the, the current socioeconomic context we're living. And finally, you know, that blend between analytic and creative that that is the, the, the basis of, of uh, architectural thinking. So. We do have all these um, qualities that are phenomenal and that definitely are important for the, um, you know, the development of our own profession in its, let's say, traditional terms. But also there are opportunities out there that uh, are new fields uh, or intersections between fields that are being defined and that we could also um, have a say on, uh, a very important leadership say on. So we call that that kind of opportunity creative leadership and we think that in the way we've been doing things as architects in the past decades, there are some key shifts uh, in mindset that would help us leverage better the skills that I just uh, explained. And these are four. I'm going to introduce these four. Then I'm going to keep, uh, you know, or, or delve more in depth with proactiveness or entrepreneurial thinking. And from there, I'm going to elaborate on a few cases that we think are, are interesting. So the first one is really proactiveness. That uh, is, is about scouting for problems, uh, about responding uh, to these problems with transformational initiatives. You were speaking um, before about Materia, this department of Mayo that, that helps to source um, uh, different types of suppliers. And that is because uh, I interpret, because definitely Mayo has that vision of the field uh, and that really that's a problem as the questions in the previous lecture were, were raising, right? So, um, so in this case, uh, it, it, it's the, the the symptom of the of of actually showing a, a scouting um, spirit and activity on the side of my to to like identify that and create a transformational initiative that is materia right so but that mindset is not that use it's not that that common in our field right um, so that's one of those the second one is definitely business focus so understanding that really um, we need to be savvy uh, as much as possible and always have the value creation and impact uh, in society in mind, and that uh, in a way, business and design are um, are fields that are you know need to be uh, stronger together. Um, that that is easy said, but in the reality, uh, we need to apprehend that kind of idea and start thinking about business in the moment we start thinking about design, because there are a lot of opportunities uh, ahead with that kind of mindset for designers in terms of the value propositions we can do, the services we can invent, and things like that. Um, third kind of major shift that I introduced uh, at the beginning is uh, this idea of co-creation, really bringing it to the next level 
in the sense that um, uh, the architects or architectural teams need to understand that more than being the ones that solve everything, they have that power uh, of being integrators, becoming catalysts of a knowledge ecosystem of people and, and, and other kinds of resources that becomes bigger than them and, and more you know, faster in response and more resilient and agile than the traditional, uh, again, artisan or Baumeister or, or author uh, that represented you know, the architectural profession in, in the 20th century, if you want. And finally, the last one is about bringing communication to the way we think and to the way we design, not only about building a discourse about what we do, uh, you know, uh, after, after we have done it, but about thinking uh, from the very beginning how this should be communicated and how uh, there's, a, there's a feedback loop between what we do and that communication. So it's about thinking about design that from the beginning inspires different audiences and, and uh, that inspiration is at the core of the design process, the reasons why the design process is as it is. Um, so these four kind of contribute to transforming the entrepreneurial mindset of our, our profession. Um, and I think um, specifically transform the notion of design uh, or, or we see you know, potential in this transformation of the notion of design into something that is about you know, being strategic and creative in the approach to problem solving. So not anymore, you know, being on this position of like being sitting on an office, uh, sort of image, uh, iconic image that I built, but like being sitting on a on an office and, and waiting for the brief to come and, 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 and solve it, which is still, again, part of our core business, but start thinking about how we should uh, act or uh, take endeavors to address problems at the system level, to solve them, you know, once and for all kind of, uh, kind of approach. Um, in relation to that, I wanted to share with you um, the um, experience of, or, or the, the case of Henry Ford, the inventor of, or, well, of the creator of Ford Motor Company, and one of the first uh, creators of the modern automobile. Um, because, and, and through that, uh, explain you know, what the core of that entrepreneurial mindset is about identification of problems and, and solutions as a basis to then uh, bring you through a number of use cases that we think are, are exciting. Um, so this was Sydney at the end of the 19th century. And as you can see, maybe in this image, you can almost even imagine the smell, the sound of this kind of urban environment. And uh, at that time, almost, you know, Henry Ford was, was kind of thinking about, about, you know, ways to transform this reality that is, you know, bucolic and romantic, but at the same time has uh, key problem that he identified quite well. You know, it's the waste and the hygiene problems of having hundreds of thousands of horses in some cities like London or New York, um, and also the lack of efficiency, both of the carriage uh, and of the you know space of these double double element system or even triple element system. You know, horse, driver, and carriage, um, and as well the way it was built with you know wooden elements that would get would be you know. Um, uh, deteriorated with time and, and hardly hardly scaled. Um, but he was also very good at reading uh, that problem together or in blend with an opportunity, an opportunity that was the reading of uh, understanding of, that of changes at multiple levels. Again, bringing it systemic systemic thinking, um, and that was you know understanding that the carburetor was was there. Uh, Mr. Benz had been done doing some already some some experiments and also there were some uh, indie uh, applications of it at the same time the industry of materials was bringing in uh, a material such as vanadium which is a, a metal that is easily um, transformable into sheets and in which you could with which you could do very simple uh, but at the same time very precise um, pieces that that were the basis for like uh, sub, um, mechanization of, of production and then one very important, which was reading the specific social environment of the American dream uh, where he lived, um, of this idea of ownership and of um, you know detachment of the worker from you know the factory to like more owning my own space, my own family, my own kids, my own car, definitely, and then my own dog and so on and so forth, and and building a value proposition that was aspiring uh, to relate directly with that. So the solution has everybody knows it's it's history and it was you know this model t the first uh, mass produced automobile from 1908 but it it was in part the solution was in part you know the creation of this 
horseless carriage, if you want, but also uh, its implementation into the assembly line. The fact that you could you know, mass produce these, do all of them the same through the same processes and radically transforming the way that, that you would you know, source the raw matter on the left of the diagram, make a number of processes, make a number of um, interactions with, with different people in the organization, both on the factory and on, on sales channels, uh, development of, of, of different communication campaigns and so on, up to the you know, final delivery of this uh, horseless carriage or modern car uh, to the, the end user, right? And communication was, and, and the, the understanding of social dynamic was definitely a key element there. Uh, the value proposition was not only, you know, here's a car, but it was, here's the car for America. Here's the, the one car for everyone, regardless of whether you are, you know, uh, a worker on the left, a businessman on the center, or a family on the right, uh, it's definitely the car that is going to solve your problem, right? So it's th this idea of not, not doing a car for only one family, highly customized, but doing something that can be mass, uh, mass produced that in the core of how it's thought uh, includes all the parameters for, for something that can be adopted by a majority of the society. And that is in fact the basis for, um, you know, for, for this kind of, of industry that we have at the moment that is completely, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new reality, right? A, a boom. So this idea of identifying a problem, reading, reading the environment in which one lives, industrial, economic, the one of your sector, in this case, architecture and construction, um, putting the lenses of, of, of seeing it through you know, opportunity and then crafting solutions that, that are value oriented and that uh, aim to, to solve problems once and for all are, is now key for every industry. It's the basis of entrepreneurship in a way but it's more and more important for innovation and renovation in, in multiple industries. So with all of that in mind, which I think um, is, is quite a lot, but I hope is, is interesting reflection for, for, you know, for, for the architectural realm and, and our positioning within it, I would like to share a number of use cases of, of these kind of ideas of problem solving beyond buildings, but that are always related to spatial design. Um, and I'm leaving aside buildings not because I don't think they're important. I myself have been, you know, uh, hugely involved in the creation of buildings, doing international competitions, and so on. But I'm, I'm leaving that aside for the purpose of this reflection because it's about innovation. It's about really thinking what the architect of, you know, the next years could be uh, and how we can complement those services with uh, with new things, right? Even in some of these cases, probably architects were not key but they could have been key or they could be key in further iterations of, of these uh, ideas. First project uh, I would like to share is Lufa Farms. And um, it's a Montreal based startup that um, claims to be delivering fresh, local and responsible food, natural food to its uh, users or clients. And the problem they identified is basically the, the fragmentation of, of the food chain, the food production chain. Um, that you know you you go to the supermarket you buy you know a pack of cheese wrapped in plastic and you don't really know where that cow was not even if it was a cow in some cases um, and all sorts of chemicals and processes are there with the impact it has for your health but also with the impact it has for for the economy right and and for the uh sorry for the economy for the for the environment right so uh that kind of upper problem has two legs one which is the environmental problem represented by the the, the let's say uh, heating of the world map on the on the left uh, lower side of the slide and on the right this kind of idea that is ramping in multiple countries across the world that people want to buy healthy local food and, and are more and more aware of that together with that they understood that spatial thinking spatially or and again bringing as you notice very different kind of readings of reality into one single uh, recite, if you want, or, or, or algorithm for problem solution, they understood that uh, there's a huge, massive surface of the world at the moment that is occupied by warehouses that are typically one story high, maximum two, uh, and in which there's a fifth facade, which is the roof that is quite, un just quite useless at the moment, and actually in many cases producing a lot of, uh, you know, heating and, and so on. So, so it's, it's really a, a valuable real estate there. Um, and finally, reading as well that, you know, it is a proper time, it is the adequate, adequate time in which um, digital synergia has, has, you know, come to our lives 
and everybody's kind of used to to do things like sourcing food uh, online. So it is really the moment, the adequate moment to start thinking about uh, different ways of going through this. So what they did, Mohammed and Lauren, who are the, the founders of Lufa, was sourcing in Montreal, strategically uh, located warehouses that could, on top of them, uh, bear these uh, these greenhouses uh, that were of high intensity production, that were um, you know located in places that were you know easy for access uh, and logistics, but at the same time close to the place uh, where their clients are, and basically just making it happen, right? So building these kind of plants, uh, and I believe they are already now in three cities um, with these um, locally source locally produced fully sustainable um ve vegetables factory basically in which uh they start extracting uh, depending on the demand and deliver in these uh lower in the in the lower vehicles that you see that are more for the last mile delivery than you know like big industrial uh kind of transportation so that's one in which definitely you know the entrepreneurial initiative in this case was taken uh, from the agropecuary industry, but definitely there's there's a lot of architecture uh, in it and there's a lot to think about how we couple different mixed uses within the city to make them work together, right? The second one is an example from Amanda Levet architecture, ALA, um, and it's called Pitch Pitch. Um, for those who don't know this office, it's uh, it's a London-based uh, global design practice uh, doing interesting things, and they they basically um, they're the, the authors of math in, in Lisbon. But um, on top of that, they they do a number of competitions, as many other practices in the world. And in this case, they were thinking about a model that could complement that that uh, business model of competitions, basically, and identify that you know uh, London, the place where they're based, has. A lot of underused urban spaces uh, with a huge um, uh, fitness culture uh, coming up, probably also the result of um, of, uh, of a quite an intensive uh, urban life, and uh, as well quite a um, how to say quite a sophisticated population that is used, you know, to to digitize. Uh, they identify that. Um, there was an opportunity in a number of plots that were small enough uh, to not um, allocate easy real estate developments um, and at the same time big enough to accommodate other types of uses, but that were somehow abandoned, temporarily abandoned or disregarded by the market because they were in situations that on top of that size, you know, either close to a bridge or, or, to, a, or to an intermediate urban location that, that wouldn't you know, be so attractive. Um, and this is the image you see on the, the first plot right on, on the left of the, of the bridge um, that basically gave them the idea of, of this business model, which is uh, about doing an easily lightweight, deploy, easily deployable lightweight structure that they can put there and partner with uh, the owner of these plots to, um, to create a, an easy booking app for, for different people from the neighborhood to just go and, and practice some sport in a highly dense urban environment, and then sharing some of those um, sharing some of those uh, revenues between the owner, um, the city, and and the, the design company, um, and that was uh, kind of the study, and, and that's the project they're trying to, to to develop. And the idea is that it's it's a complementary business model to um, you know to this idea of of uh, of the competitions um, office, right? This is something it's uh, on the website. You can see it. Uh, um, if you are curious. Uh, third one is um, uh, an example from um, a company that was built uh, now is, is um, vanished, but, but the technology is still there, which is the company that was Spanish based and it's called Urban Data Eye. And it was a blend between three data scientists and uh, an architect and, and two urbanism experts. Uh, so they were the three of them were sort of tech people and data scientists, and at the same time, architecture and urbanism experts. And they identified that um, a problem that we've been dealing with for a really long time, which is that, you know, very well represented in this image, which is that we really don't know how people use public space. It's pretty hard to predict, and it's pretty hard to optimize. Uh, the more we do maps and heat maps uh, by hand or by, you know, digital tools about how these would behave, uh, the more we realize we don't really know how that works. 
And reading again another aspect from reality, they discovered, you know, they realized more than discovered that uh, our world is more and more full of, of kind of uh, menacing CCTV circuits that uh, survey the world um, in different numbers, ramping from, you know, things like 1 million in Australia to 200 million cameras in, in places like China for different purposes. Um, but the, the, the reality is that there are a, a big number of them that um, are, are there only, you know, for, for the purpose, a, the basic purpose of, of surveilling, you know, events in general without, you know, over doing over surveillance to people. So they have very low um, um, definition. So they can preserve the privacy of, of individuals, right? So they started doing this um, prototype of putting a camera in the square of Callao in the center of Madrid. The street you see here is the Gran Villa in Madrid. And then the, there's a camera in one of the uh, 19th, 20th century uh, skyscrapers and that looks to the Callao Square, which is about 80 meters far, the geometric center of it. And they said, can we use this low uh, fidelity footage to start trying to recognize movement patterns in the public space? And as well, trying to differentiate between different types of, of people like young, um, old, child, men, women, uh, a car, um, you know, public furniture and things like that. And can we extract some patterns of usage of public space based on, on that uh, algorithm? They were extremely actually, be, and, and this is a, a hypothesis they have, but they were like twice as precise and twice as effective as any kind of other competition algorithm doing similar things. And they were the only team that was actually done fully by architects that were the ones thinking about the variables that built that algorithm. And I, I mean, you know, they think, we think as well that it's, you know, it's by no coincidence. It is really something that has to do with how we approach the spatial problem. So what they delivered to their clients was basically uh, an understanding of public space in terms of graphs of when there's more use, when there's less use, what is done in different parts of these squares and, and so on, uh, that not only cities would pay a lot of money for uh, and extract a lot of value for, but but as well, you know, different types of organizations um, um, would be interested in. Um, and the question here is, of course, there is a philosophical debate around this um, that I would be willing to speak about, but probably is not so much the focus of this. But um, the question here, when we bring it back to our architectural profession is, yes, this is technology, but isn't it really also essentially architectural? Isn't it really something that is dealing in a contemporary way with our understanding of space and breaking the boundaries of what space is? Um, should we bring that into the conversation of architectural services or should we just forget about that and let tech people do it? Um, that's a big question, right? Um, another of our partners, as much as Mayo, that we cherish a lot and that we are, you know, very happy with the, the partnership in the, in the, the, let's say, America region, uh, is UN Studio for, for the European region. And they do um, a number of projects together with their other spin-off, which is UN Sense. And these are a project called Solar Visuals. Um, this is their vision of, you know, whatever the future may bring, uh, which is about questioning things, basically. And, Again, responding to the problem I, I, I explained about sustainability and so on, uh, they identified really one of the key problems is for architectural um, design and for the built environment is this idea of PVs, photovoltaic panels that are extremely outdated, ugly and, and, and awkward looking when, when, they, when they are installed in different uh, spaces, right? So they had the expertise of building uh, prominent buildings and but they thought, you know, can we, start asking uh, questions about, about the elements that compose these buildings. Can we start thinking about what if solar panels were so smart and efficient uh, that, and, and look so good that they could virtually cover uh, a whole facade, as an example, and, and start um, giving us you know, lessons about, about how they could occupy different spaces in the city uh, without being so noticed. So they defined this solar visuals project. They created these photovoltaic panels that can actually take um, many different um, patterns and, and images with different coverage of, of uh, photovoltaic cells and different degrees of efficiency. But basically what I like about this image is that again, it's thinking about solving the problem, not for a beautiful building only, 
but it's think about solving the problem for society in general. Uh, it's about making this photovoltaic panel at a price level, at a, a availability level, and at a aesthetical level that can penetrate uh, the built environment heavily, because that's what is really going to change the status quo, not just doing one or two beautiful buildings, right? So um, it's basically pursuing the sustainable development goal of ma making cities and building climate neutral by 2030. And actually, this is implemented in this building on the right facade and, and providing information about you know, different um, efficiencies depending on, on the position of, of, the, of, the, um, of each of the cells, but also of, of the whole system altogether and so on. And I have a few cases, but I think I should be done in about um, five to six minutes. Let me know if, if um, I should, because I can also skip some of them. Um, there's this very interesting example from SHOP, uh, which is tackling uh, urban regulations um, in the problem of urban regulations in any city, which is kind of related to this caricature. Um, and together, reading it in the opportunity environment of New York, which is probably one of the uh, you know most expensive real estate locations in the world, with with very intensive air rights and regulations of all kinds that that made kind of uh, competitive that market. And they said th they made their own problem, right? They thought, what if we could improve the regulations interpretation process in summary? Can we create or can we contribute to create a, a, an app that that does this? And it's called Envelope. Um, and basically what, what it does is take the, the regulations of a plot and size up all the different variables um, uh, and provide uh, a number of tools on top of that for, for the different stakeholders of the construction cycle from real estate investor to builder or architect um, and, or, and even in, in some cases institutions that, that might be interesting in, in, in developing buildings or, or developing some, some sort of regulations and things like that. So it provides the tools for interpretation, but also predictive analytics and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump over MIMA housing. Um, I'm going to get uh, straight to this uh, 50 Super Rio uh, project, which is from IE uh, professors. Uh, and it's called the, the Adapta3 algorithm. And it's very, in a way, contemporary with the context we're living. They define themselves, interestingly, not as architects, but as um, spatial strategists for sustainable development and growth. And they wanted to tackle the problem of uh, the health crisis that we're living at the moment with multiple cities, actually, uh, not anymore in these months, but let's see what happens in the coming months. But definitely in the previous times with you know, the problem of, of informal uh, hospitals and health um, infrastructures, the problems they have for like setting um, circuits, safety circuits, uh, distancing between the parts um, and so on. And they said, can we use uh, the way we understand space together with parametric computing to define an algorithm that, that, that helps us to lay out these kind of facilities? So giving it a few parameters um, a few requirements of types of spaces, types of usages, um, and then perhaps also um, some ideas about constructive systems. Should that be, you know, containers? Should that be more like wooden elements, uh, metal elements, uh, textile elements? And then can that start creating layouts for us that we can uh, start building on um, for for these type of facilities? And this algorithm actually did these kind of spaces uh, depending on the parameters that were given automatically, uh, guaranteeing distancing between beds, guaranteeing uh, circulations, and making sure that they only use the metal frame for the container, the textile elements, and the, the horizontal slabs. Uh, and it could go as, as detailed as you know, the distribution of internal spaces to ensure uh, more efficiency in terms of usage of furniture or different distributions and, and things like that. Um, and then we have a, a student from the MBR uh, a few years ago that was uh, Abril Hernandez, who's from Mexico. And uh, this is very interesting social and spatial reading and also a very original problem, I think, uh, which was you know, in Mexico and in every other country, the, the problem of the infrastructure of debt, basically, let alone debt, which is a problem for all of us. But uh, unfortunately, architecture cannot solve that yet. Uh, but definitely, uh, you know, um, the, the problem of having these spaces in the center of the city with what it implies for the soil, with what it implies for you know the, the, the value chain that is related to that. 
and and as well what it implies in the sensitivity of this context the idea that or, or the need we have to be close to our relatives and people we love and at the same time have a quality space for themselves and a privacy sp space for ourselves and you know that's even more important in a country like mexico in which the culture and uh, the you know bringing in this idea of, of in a way celebrating and at the same time regretting death is is a fundamental part of their culture so what i've real uh identified is that actually design uh can do a lot for that spatial design can do a lot for that if we take it you know from a different angle uh think about affordability and think about a, a culture of proximity bringing closer this notion of going and visiting your your loved people um than it is right now so it was this thought about a system of combining urns niches and iconic very small iconic buildings uh in a network uh, around the city that could be designed by different architects. And these are just from, from pavilions that, that happen, uh, or more or less sacred pavilions that happen in, in, in different locations. And that could work as a, in a way as a platform that, that provides value to, um, to the, the living ones that are related to the person that is you know, um, uh, buried or maintained in this uh, system. So basically you could, even before you pass away but also your relatives could take some decisions about how that is going to be closer to your house in a network of distributed spaces uh have a management uh and, and have a, access some services remotely that can be you know quite automated having some uh support to to this whole uh, transition moment and then having a, a way to manage like sending flowers to this space or or booking the space to generate like once a year for instance a ceremony or doing something like that um i have a couple of more examples uh let me know if we're we're doing uh bad on time i think these are yeah exactly two more examples and the concluding thoughts um the cur the court example is very interesting for curb management so basically sidewalk management and it's a company that uh wants to tackle the problems of you know the, how chaotic or how wonderful it can be to have a, a, a bad or, or well uh, organized sidewalk, right? And as well, understanding that there's a huge opportunity for that because sidewalks are pretty much everywhere in our lives, as this image, uh, as you can imagine very well from looking at you know the street level of this of this image. So what they said is we can do a, a platform in which we can uh, digitize this this service line that the curb represents. Um, to, to be able to manage it from the point of view of uh, different organizations, mainly governmental organizations. So we can provide information about the status of each curb, the elements and uh, cycles of management to uh, basically make them more efficient and uh, you know, st start having more dynamic uh, adaptations in the city, more um, uh, coupling with intelligent uh, mobility fleets, uh, being able to do different experiments to to, to test whether you know uh, more terrace or less terrace works better or, or worse in a part of the city and and so on and so forth. Um, and that again, it's it's really it's the city. It's a, it's about public space. It's not about technology. It's it's a problem that is in the it should be in the core of architectural thinking in a way. Um, and to wrap up uh, with examples, this idea of or this pro project from Space and Matter Architects in, in Amsterdam, which is called the Coivo, and that was the solution to a problem of a highly contaminated or po polluted industrial soil in Amsterdam North, uh, coupled with very little resources for recovery on the side of, of the, the institutions. Um, so there was a call for a competition with a very, very tight budget and it was about recovering this place and making something out of it to meanwhile, you know, and um, the people from space and matter, they realized actually um, there's another problem, which is this abandoned or, or poorly maintained uh, boats that, that lie on multiple canals of, of the city and that in the majority of, in, in a number of cases are just given away uh, for free. So they said, why don't we source a number of these ones we bring them in almost for free um, and then we restore them and build a sort of temporary settlement in this site um, that we connect with this sidewalk that, that kind of flies on top of this space so that there's virtually no direct, uh, no direct connection with that soil. And meanwhile, we, you know, we, we make a garden grow there. And meanwhile, we start you know, cleaning that soil and doing a lot of pilots for sustainability and so on. 
So it's about a model community uh, that is built with extremely efficient resources in which you know, there's a whole model of an idea of circularity, uh, of connectivity between all the other, all the different uh, parts, both the, the living ones, the more the lab ones, some productive uh, ones, some socialization, like a cafe spaces and things like that, and really building a diagram or a system of uh, collaboration between all of them, um, in which there are initiatives that can be studied, such as this one that is called Juliet, which is this idea of um, having a, a, a coin, a currency that you can exchange, that you can earn by having a photovoltaic energy transformation in your ceiling, that you can have your sort of wallet, and then you can exchange with your, your neighbors um, when one or the other uh, sort of needs that. So it's encouraging peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, of energy. And again, uh, space and matter architects here they did the they did the project and yes there is a lot of spatial design but there's also strategic design and thinking right so it's it's beyond the shape of buildings uh, so what connects really all of these cases uh, to wrap up if we think about art, arts and crafts the problem in a way could be summarized are as pursuit of beauty and their focus is more on on creation right if we think about science in a way, their problem is knowledge creation and their focus in, is in theory and, and experimentation. This is a simplification, but hope you get, uh, get the idea. If you think about engineering, the problem is utility, making things that are based on the, the other domains useful for, for a particular purpose. And uh, generally the focus is on optimization. And what about you think about design? Um, you know, it's often this feeling that it's a no man's land. And I think in the we we think one of the key areas in the future is about being the ones that have that strategic definition and approach to the problem of any of these other uh, of any of these other domains. So it's it's in a way you know uh, the hands-on philosophy component that that puts to work uh, transformative initiatives in in society. And I very much like this image from Ren Kuhas, which is uh, kind of amazing not done on purpose but he's sort of the you know known architect but at the same time wearing this uh, uh, agricultural and at the same time could be confused with sanitary or scientific uh, dress that that is putting him you know in between these these different um domains so and that brings us back to these transformations that we that i mentioned at the beginning that we need to really undertake so again um there's a lot of opportunity out there we're definitely into thinking and innovation within the roots of architectural profession, which is buildings, which still represents six architects turnover, at least in areas like Europe, but there's much more to that. So um, hopefully um, we can bring a little bit of that uh, to our world. And really defining that future role requires applying this spatial design logic beyond the shape of, of buildings. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap and um, thank you for for your time and hopefully it's uh it's interesting and i'm more than happy to take a few questions if there's time hello Geronimo. thank you so much for this great exposition i think everybody has enjoyed it very much um we have several questions from the audience so i think it's time for for us to start asking you um actually i have a personal question first and i would like to 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 provide it to you uh thinking about how yeah. you're talking about the way that architects should have a more holistic profile with everything going on um, in making architects a little bit more archipreneurs um, and knowing that some of the best startups that we know already that have been successful, such as Airbnb, YouTube, Etsy, Canvas, have been founded by architects or designers. What do you think should be the role of architects in the startup ecosystem or in the architecture, in the way architecture can influence the way startups are being made? today yeah so so we are um sorry uh, are you still speaking or should i just get yeah okay yeah uh i i, I think there was a little lack uh but yeah thanks for that question it's very interesting i think again we did it back to um this idea of integration between uh between different um profiles and, and domains i think architects are um, are very good at, at, at managing multiple hats and at yeah. creating the strategic vision between, uh, you know, we 
myself, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the founder of a startup in the construction industry, and I understand the more, the more you get into these world, you understand that there are animals that ship their skin every, you know, one or two months uh, at the beginning, and then every six months. So they're extremely changing environments and, and relating in very different ways with their industries. And I think architects, of course, if they're within the built environment startup industry, they have that, that uh, I think there, there are these, these roles that can paint the big picture and help everybody to understand how to implement that. So it's a strategic role. And if they are in other kinds of industries, I think it's, it's, it's as well, it's about vision and it's as, about, I think where we stand out, it's about bringing to the world uh, ideas in a very um, you know, tangible, uh, but at the same time, I think feasible and an attractive way in the sense of fulfilling a human purpose, right? So, yeah, yeah. I think that those are those are skills in which we can thrive. And actually, uh, following up on that same topic, um, we have another question from Christina. Um, you are directing a master for architects. How is doing a master the way forward at this time and age? What is the value of formal training? Yeah, um, so thanks for that question. Basically, you know, uh, formal training is, I, I believe, is about transforming your mindset. Um, it's not so much about learning a set of um, tools that are more immediate that you can learn on a, on a, on a YouTube, uh, you know, um, tutorial or something like that, or even on a more specific program that is uh, focused on, you know, I don't know, finance uh, management of, you know, Excel, pro Excel or things like that. It's more about a transformational journey of, of the, 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 the professional, both in understanding uh, its industry in a, or his or her industry in a radically different way. And at the same time, taking the, the experience of transformation. And, and let me put you a very, a very human if you want a very human experience which is this the experience people have when they you know they 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 have a child right so it's you can you can read how many times you want what having a child means but you will never experience it or learn it until you actually have done it and you've been through and then you become a dad or a mom and and you know yeah. you start seeing things completely differently I think that's a key difference between uh, formal training and informal training, and and it really makes a difference. We think we tend. I've spoken about defining the role of architects in in five to ten years from now, and really, when you take a master that is a top uh, level academic, you know, offer, not you know a, a, another kind of program. It's not only about thinking your about your next job. Of course, it's about thinking of, of your next job, but it's also about thinking who you want to become in 10 years from now and how that first door is going to open 10 other doors, right? Um, and it, it, it's really about that. And I, I think it's the case in our master, but it's also the case in, in the masters I've studied and, and, and other you know, offers are, that are out there. Hope that answers the question. Of course, I think... It, that it's exactly as you explain it and um, everything that you have said in the in this presentation has been of extreme value to everybody connected. So thank you so much, Jeronimo, and thank you uh, to all of the IE team that has joined us through Chipped by Design. We're extremely excited to keep moving forward with uh, this partnership between the IE School of Architecture and Design and Mayor Arquitectos. So thank you so much, Jeronimo. Thank you. Thank you so much as well. And, and thanks to, to the whole team of, uh, of my own. And uh, we're as well, we're very excited to keep uh, working with, with you. I hope it's been useful for, for everyone. And I hope you enjoy uh, Carol Ratti's lecture in a, in a moment. Um, and congratulations for this amazing week. Great. Thank you so much, Jeronimo.